good morning, everyone, and welcome um, to this talk today about medical aid in dying in Colorado. Uh, my name is Eric Campbell. I'm a professor of medicine and the director of research at the Center for Bioethics and Humanities here at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. Um, I'd like to begin today uh, by introducing our speaker. Uh, Dr. Dr. Hillary Lum is an associate professor of medicine in the division of geriatric medicine at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. She completed her MD and her PhD at the University of Wisconsin and did her internal med medicine training at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, she moved to the University of Colorado in 2011 and has been doing it and did a geriatric and a palliative care medicine fellowship. Um, she currently is a practicing physician and focuses on providing care for older adults uh, in the UC Health Seniors Clinic and really seeks to improve care for older adults with serious illness. Her research is focused on designing real world interventions in partnership with older adults and includes work in interventions in uh, advanced care planning, the use of patient portals, telehealth uh, to reach older rural veterans and virtual reality and also music therapy. So she, in, and in addition, medical aid and dying. So she has a very diverse set of research interests and, and topics. Um, in terms of housekeeping details today, please post your questions in the, in the Q and A um, and we will address them at the end of Dr. Lum's talk. Um, so thank you, Dr. Lum for taking the time and, and preparing this talk for the medical community here in Colorado. Really wonderful to be here. Thank you to Eric and the Center for Bioethics and Humanities and the Colorado Medical Society for coordinating this. Really appreciate everyone logging in at 7 a.m. We know that you have many things that you may be doing, including being on your commute to work. So this will be recorded on the Center's website and you can refer back to it um, as you desire. We know that today's um, community of people who are participating and have registered are very diverse and we really welcome your input in the Q&A as Dr. Campbell mentioned. So please do be reflecting on your own questions related to medical aid and dying, put them into the Q&A. We hope to have a lively discussion even as we're doing this presentation. Um, and I have about 35 slides, so we hope to have 20 minutes to really have interactive discussion even through this platform. So we want to share some uh, input and a few uh, objectives. We'll focus on understanding the personal and professional characteristics of physicians who responded to our statewide survey related to the range of MAID activities in Colorado. Secondly, we'll present some information about their report of experiences and challenges or barriers to providing MAID service. Finally, we'll also consider the impact of a centralized made clinical service. We asked some questions about what clinical services were involved as physicians were participating in made activities. And so these are new data from the survey that we are interested in sharing and discussing. In terms of some funding and conflict of interest, you can see that here. We are grateful to the Greenwald Foundation for their interest and in funding through the Making a Difference program. These uh, data have uh, been working their way out into the published literature. So um, several of our findings today are already in a Journal of General Internal Medicine publication, as well as the survey methodology, which I think is very rigorous and novel, is published by Dr. Kinney on behalf of our team in scientific reports. Here's a glance of our research team. This has been a two-year project and highly uh, interprofessional as we really seek to combine a lot of different perspectives in medical aid and dying. We know that you as an audience also reflect different perspectives in the community, perhaps legal, medical, as well as interprofessional within healthcare. So uh, briefly, our agenda today, uh, we'll introduce a bit about Colorado Medical Aid in Dying here since 2017, share with you the methods of our survey so that you can understand our results. Then we'll think through some different sections of results from the survey of physicians, implications, and Q&A. So in terms of medical aid in dying, just 
some being on the same page ground setting. This is what we're referring to when a physician provides a competent terminate, terminally ill patient with a prescription for a lethal dose of medication for the purpose of ending their life. We know that um, prescriptions are what we can track. Um, there are different surveys in the literature that have worked to assess how often an individual who has received a prescription then uh, completes uh, the medical aid and dying activities in terms of choosing to end their life. There's a lot of different words in the literature and also in practice related to uh, medical aid and dying. Some have uh, written about and use physician assisted suicide or physician assisted death. We also know that the policies and laws vary by state, region, country, um, around the world. So we will use medical aid and dying since this focuses on Colorado. In terms of medical aid and dying and its um, legality um, or approved use across the country, this map shows um, the different states that have enacted medical aid and dying since 1997. Oregon was first. Um, you can then see that there are approximately 13 jurisdictions where medical aid and dying is legal, such that about 25% of the US population theoretically have access to, or at least live in states where made is legal. In terms of our Colorado data, and I'll show you more information in particular, there have been 159 doctors uniquely who have prescribed made medications to a 554 patients um, receiving prescriptions. I wanna briefly just describe what's required here in Colorado. The patient is 18 years or older, a Colorado resident, terminally ill with a prognosis of six months or less um, as um, estimated by an attending physician as well as a consulting physician. That person uh, is acting voluntarily, mentally capable of making their own healthcare decisions. As many of you know, an individual cannot specify ahead of time in an advanced directive or other advanced care planning document a desire to participate in MAID. And the individual needs to be capable of MAID drug self-administration. I wanna just to highlight that there is reporting through CDPHE, our Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. I'm showing you a screenshot here of this. And so there is a process set up um, upon uh, approval of medical aid and dying in 2017, this process where um, the physician registers and is providing documentation aligned with the statute related to MAID. So listing here that the attending must receive two oral requests that are separated by 15 days at least from the patient. The physician writes the prescription, fills out this reporting form, confirms the patient's mental capacity. There's also then the role of the consulting physician, which is listed here, confirming the attending's assessment um, and signing as well. So I wanted to show you just the um, use of prescription or the prescribing patterns uh, since 2017. So dispensed made prescriptions are shown in red, prescribed made prescriptions are shown in orange. So these are from pharmacy data. You can um, acknowledge, you know, we can acknowledge that there's the prescription um, and then there are still barriers at the patient level in terms of being able to receive the made medication, including cost and or access actually being able to connect with a pharmacy that has medications uh, in stock to be dispensed. CDPHE also asks for reporting related to what are the terminally ill reasons or the diagnosis that individuals have. And so that's shown in this graph here from 2017 to 2020. So the individuals um, who were most commonly prescribed made prescriptions, 63% are related to malignant neoplasms. Second, about 18% progressive neurological disorders then cardiovascular disease, lung diseases, as well as in other category. So these data are helpful uh, to know in terms of which types of patients may be requesting medical aid in dying, and then also are highly relevant 
to our survey methodology. A little bit of um, demonstration of Colorado physicians who have written a made prescription. These data again from 2017 to 2020 from CDPHE, and you can see the number of prescriptions. Uh, in recognizing the diversity of our audience today, some of you may be individuals who have a lot of firsthand knowledge of this process, uh, and have maybe even been one of the Colorado prescribing uh, physicians registered through CDPHE and others maybe are in our ecosystem of knowing that patients may have requests for information, requests for referrals, um, and or you may be part of clinical services or community organizations interested in what are our um, current practices. So we'll continue on with that. That leads us to the impetus for this study. In reviewing the data, both in Colorado as well as nationally, there's little data on MADE to inform policy and practice, in particular related to what do uh, physicians, our ecosystems, uh, our healthcare systems need to increase equitable use access um, to MADE, as well as understanding what are the experiences of physicians who are participating in this process. We are limited in terms of surveys, in terms of how well we can reach physicians um, directly. What we mean by that is state law forbids the state employers and physician groups from releasing the actual identities of made patients or providers. So we've been thinking about physicians who are involved in made activities almost as a hidden population. That was really um, one of the rationales for how we built our survey the way we did. We know that it's very difficult to ask about this uh, conversation and these activities that they can be sensitive. And so we needed to think about the best way to um, achieve a sample in Colorado that most likely reflected Colorado. And we had to do it fairly indirectly. We know that some doctors fear being identified as a made provider. So taken together, our study objective is to examine the nature of Colorado physicians' participation in MAID. And in, this, uh, in presenting these results, publishing them, these are the first state-level data on the experiences of physicians. Um, and we think that these methods um, and the survey can certainly be repeated in other states and jurisdictions to see how well our Colorado practices um, compare or differ from other areas. So I now want to spend a little bit of time getting into the methods. Again, our participants are Colorado physicians. Our sampling I will share with you more about, but the goal is really to identify physicians caring for patients likely to request medical aid in dying. So thinking about those individuals with um, serious illness, the diagnoses that have been reported to Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, and working backwards to then identify the physicians likely to be caring for those individuals. This survey is anonymous. We really wanted to make sure that individuals had high confidence that their responses could not ever be linked back to them, and we were able to maintain that. So in seeking to identify patients, especially who provide routine outpatient care to a cohort of patients with serious illnesses, similar to those who have filled a prescription for MAID, we started with the Colorado All Payers Claims Database, a wonderful resource that has a repository of all healthcare billing claims on nearly all patients who receive healthcare service in the state of Colorado. So by using this database, we were then able to work backwards. We identified from billing claims what types of billing codes, which were related to diagnoses that patients had. And then we link those to the either physician group or ultimately the individual physicians with NPI numbers across the state of Colorado. Um, and we're able to divide that group of physicians who have higher likelihood of caring for these individuals with uh, these ICD-10, these billing um, codes related to diagnoses to then be our group of physicians that we hoped to reach out to. Um, again, this is in more detail in Dr. Kinney's publication, and we're happy to also answer any questions about the methodology. 
a little bit about the survey. So we developed this very rigorously, first scanning the literature, talking with a number of key informants and interviews with made knowledgeable physicians, pre-testing using cognitive interviewing where we had our initial questions, asked individuals to help pilot them with us, listened well for what they understood those questions to be meaning from their perspective and continued to refine the questions. The final survey was four pages long and took five minutes to complete. So I mentioned to you from our group of potentially eligible physicians here in Colorado identified through the All Pairs Claims Database who've been caring for individuals with terminally ill um, diagnoses. You can see that at the top, the patients, then physicians who either bill um, as an individual NPI or an organizational NPI. So this is certainly a lot of details. We then had a process where we wanted to rank the likelihood of discussing made. So that was related to what specialty individuals were in, knowing that oncology, perhaps a higher likelihood of discussing made than some of the other specialties. Um, and ultimately this resulted in three survey waves. We wanted a chance to have one outcome of this project be this novel sampling method to see if we had a higher likelihood of having respondents who had had experience with made activities. So we were able to optimize how we sampled our physicians with each wave. The survey was administered by the Center for Survey Research. We sent it by mail with a $50 cash incentive. Here you can see the waves listed um, in the time of COVID. Um, and each physician was included in only one round. We weren't able to do any follow-ups because again, this was completely anonymous. We had no idea who returned, so we wouldn't be able to send reminders or other nudge. And we have an overall response rate of 55% which is 300 completed surveys. So we were very pleased with this um, and now excited to share the results. So uh, as you are in the audience thinking about this, if you were to design a survey to really understand what do physicians think and experience related to MAID, would love to hear in the Q&A whether any of your topics um, would have been things that you would have advocated for in the survey. Here are the things and examples of questions that we in, were able to include. We wanted to ask about willingness. If you were asked today, would you be willing to uh, be involved in various activities of MAID? And I'll be coming back to this. So I want to just be clear of the different categories we grouped um, MAID activities into discussions about made with a patient, either initiated by a patient or perhaps brought up by the provider. Second, referring an eligible patient to another physician for made, serving as the made consulting physician, serving as the attending, being present with when a patient took made medications. We also asked about preparedness to be part of those same activities. Then we asked about actual participation. So since 2017, when MAID became legal in Colorado, have you referred a patient? Have you served as the consulting attending? Have you served as the uh, attending physician? And if yes, for approximately how many patients? So perhaps some of you listening in today, um, I'd love to, for you to be reflecting on where would you have fit in these categories if you have actually participated in MAID activities, because we will be highlighting some of the responses um, across our survey. We also asked about barriers to MAID. So this was independent of whether anyone had participated in MAID activities. We're now just asking in general uh, for physicians input on how much they felt any of these were uh, a barrier from not a barrier to a large barrier. And we also asked some demographics. This is very limited in terms of our demographic uh, questions because we really wanted to maintain anonymity. So now I'm gonna shift into our results, focusing first on the characteristics of physicians who completed our survey, and then also the experiences and challenges that these individuals reported related to MAID services in Colorado. 
So here's our sample of 300 respondents um, in 2020 and 2021. Um, and you can see that um, there are about 40% female. Um, the sample was largely white, nearly 80%. Um, and there was a range of specialties. Um, the largest group was family medicine at nearly 30%. Uh, we also, you know, through the sampling, we're able to uh, reach and have respondents from these other specialties. We were successful in reaching individuals who provide largely outpatient care, nearly 92%. For any of you who are um, practitioners in the long-term care setting, uh, there were about 13% of individuals from long-term care setting in, in our population, and almost 10% also provide care in a hospice setting. So these are not mutually exclusive, of course. Um, this gives you a sense of the representativeness of the different practice settings of the physician respondents. Most of our uh, respondents had practiced medicine for more than 10 years, so 17% were in the less than 10 years uh, time frame. So here's our first result slide, and I'm going to take some time to walk through this because there's a lot of data here. We are showing the responses actually from the three different questions, asking about willingness to participate, preparedness to participate, and then actual participation in various made activities. So those are um, listed here and specifically discussing MAID, referring MAID, serving as a consulting, and serving as an attending. So the blue is willingness, orange is prepared, and you can see that there are the most people who would be willing, sort of in a theoretical sense, or they're um, may be ready. Prepared is uh, their definition of if someone came in and asked to discuss, asked me to refer, asked me to serve, asked me to be the attending, I would be prepared. And then the gray is the actual participation. So you can see that there are a number of individuals who are willing related to each of these made activity ca categories. And then the um, certainly let fewer people who have had direct experience with MAID activity. These gray bars here, the 13% uh, who have served as cult consulting MDs, 8% who have served as attending. I want to highlight that because um, this notes that we were able to successfully um, reach individuals who re replied with our survey that they had actually participated in prescribing made medications for patients. And then we specifically analyzed um, separately these individuals wanting to ask, you know, how is their experience perhaps different or not than individuals who are prepared or willing but haven't actually participated. I wanted to share a little bit more about those who have served as the made attendings or consultants. There's this question about whether individuals are the longitudinal provider. Um, you need to be the attending physician. You need to be that person's primary source of care. And 86% reported that they had cared for their most recent MAID patient prior to providing MAID. We also wanted to know how many patients have you um, served in terms of being the attending and consultant? And so the average among those who had been the attending or consultant was nearly four with a range of one patient to 20 patient. So that also gives you just a sense of sort of a, the first three years of experience from 2017 to 2020 among our respondents. How frequently is this coming up in someone's practice? Uh, also, there was a high level of agreement. 96% of physicians um, who had participated in the past remained willing to do so at the time that they completed the survey. Now I'm going to transition into experiences. What is it like among these in, for these individuals who have participated in medical aid and dying for a patient. We ask them to think about their most recent case. You could think about your most recent case and think through to what extent, and is it some extent or great extent is what we're showing here, 
To what extent was your participation professionally risky, ethically challenging, um, or these other aspects of the experience as listed here? So our results from these individuals who have participated and made really show a high level of the experience being somewhat ex to some extent or to a great extent professionally rewarding and emotionally fulfilling. It was also noted to be time consuming. About 47% said that it was ethically challenging. So these are things that we're gonna to continue to come back to and we would love in the discussion for you to think about um, different ways that this could be professionally rewarding or emotionally fulfilling. I think we can all imagine ways that it's time consuming and we can think from a system perspective if there are ways that we could reduce this um, perhaps experiential barrier. This is another very full slide presenting a lot of data that I'll walk us through. So we then also asked about barriers to involvement in MAID. And this is all survey respondents in red. So this is all 300 individuals. So people who are willing, maybe people who are prepared. What are their perspectives on um, how much this is a moderate or large barrier? So we, from the survey, combined the responses for moderate and large barrier, and that's what we're showing here. And we then list a number of different barriers here on the left-hand side, from knowledge, concern about being a maid, known as a maid provider, time, emotional investment, professional ethics concerns, religious concerns, lack of support from colleagues, and policies of the physician's employer or practice, perhaps. So in focusing first on the red, um, you can see that lack of knowledge um, at nearly 47% was a common barrier, as well as, again, emotional investment, 46% uh, and professional ethics. We then wanted to think through how is the experience and report of barriers different for individuals who have not served as the consulting uh, or attending uh, physician, so that's in blue, compared to those who have had experience with actual participation, so shown in yellow. And here I think it's very interesting, and we've highlighted the significant differences based on p-values. You can see that in blue, for those who have not had the direct experience of actual participation, lack of knowledge was, a, was noted as a very high barrier as compared to those who have participated barrier of knowledge was very low. In fact, almost, you know, one of the least noted barriers. So we think that this is interesting as we tease out as individuals who are physicians have experience as the attending or consulting physician, um, what then they perceive as barriers to their activities compared to not. And we see, you know, significant reductions in a number of the barriers, um, though there are still some that are certainly here. Emotional investment, time investment are, are still here. So happy to come back to this and think through this in the Q&A. So in summary, biggest barriers from the perspective of all respondents, knowledge about medical aid and dying, and professional ethics. Then among those who have actually participated, time investment and emotional investment. I'm going to take a little bit of pause here and tell us more about knowledge about medical aid and dying. I've been telling you about a survey in practicing physicians, many of them who have been in practice for over 10 years. We also recently did an assessment of internal medicine resident perspectives on MAID in future practice. And this is, was by Dr. Pham while he was an internal medicine resident and is now one of our palliative care fellows here at University of Colorado. So we wanted to survey the internal medicine residents to ask them about any barriers um, to knowledge or practice related to use of made in their future practice, knowing that resident physicians are not able to be the attending or the consulting, however, wanting to know how well they felt prepared. So here's a figure from that paper where we're looking at the perceived needs and especially in blue, these are where residents reported a high need that this, these topics were very needed for them to then feel prepared um, either in 
understanding of medical aid in dying or even being involved in the future. And so some of the high reports of very needed information were the process for physician participation, the process for patients to request made. We get this sense that it's just sort of a black box where residents are unsure of what would be needed if someone were to ask, including even the sort of aspects of the Colorado statute. What are, what's patient eligibility? Um, what are demographics of patients who even um, in our Colorado community are requesting um, MAID um, activities? Thankfully, many felt um, fairly confident compared to the other questions in terms of goals of care conversations. So key takeaways to summarize what we've learned from physicians who have participated and made about their experience, 80% um, or more would be willing to discuss or refer for MAID. So as a study team, we think one aspect of this is that in Colorado, we seem to have sufficient number of Colorado physicians to provide MAID, though because of our anonymity um, concerns, we really have no idea of the distribution of these physicians across Colorado. Um, and we can think about distribution in lots of different ways types of practice, geographic location, specialties. A next point is that 75% of made consultants or attendings reported involvement to be professionally rewarding and emotionally fulfilling. So we really appreciate this finding. I think much of the literature has really focused on challenges of made, ethical concerns, um, and we feel these are novel findings in recognizing that as part of practice, it's something that these physicians uh, felt was rewarding and fulfilling. Third point, providing MAID was perceived as time consuming and ethically challenging. So those are known barriers that we also saw in our uh, survey, as well as lack of knowledge. I now wanna shift um, to our final part of uh, our survey to thinking about the potential impact of centralized made clinical service. These are very exploratory results. So I'll just give that as a large caveat. Um, and we weren't within the context of this survey to even ask a lot of details about a clinical service. It was one or two questions where we asked individuals about a made clinical service and we didn't get a chance to define it um, or to explore more about it. Nonetheless, we asked, in your most recent made case, were any of the following services involved? So across the uh, bottom here, you can see we asked about a number of different clinical services that, as the uh, researchers, we thought could potentially be involved. Palliative care, ethics, psychiatry, social work, a MAID program, or hospice. So if you focus first on the red, that's the uh, respondents who had participated as an attending or a consultant. So again, this is the smaller subset of physician respondents. Those individuals rated or marked that these different services were involved and you can see the frequencies. So palliative care and hospice were very commonly used as well as social work. MAID program was used about 63% of the time and somewhat surprisingly to us um, when we were designing this survey, ethics and psychiatry were really very rarely used because this is a, a small number of respondents, um, about 50 physician respondents who had participated thinking about their most recent made case, um, you, know, you can see that the numbers are relatively small here. We then also explored if the service was not used, would it have been valuable? And that's what we're showing here in yellow. So we'll highlight here among made programs for individuals who didn't use a MAID program, perhaps didn't have access to it, um, they 67% said the service would have been valuable. We wanted to look at any potential influence of having a MAID service involved in the most recent case um, on these, these physician report of experiences in MAID. So I'll direct you here to along the bottom, again, these questions of, was the most recent case emotionally fulfilling, ethically challenging, and so forth. And when we compare blue, 
those individuals who did not involve a maid service compared to yellow, where a maid service was involved, we see that there is a significant increase in the rating of the most recent case being emotionally fulfilling. It, we also saw that the most recent case was much less reported to feel professionally risky. No significant change related to ethically challenging, professionally rewarding, or time consuming. It is interesting that from a time consuming perspective, uh, there wasn't a, a large perceived difference here. So key takeaways from this little bit of data related to maid services and other services, over 80% of maid cases involved hospice and or palliative care services. About 60% of the consultants or attendings who have been involved used a centralized maid service, though as I noted, we really weren't able to ask about the availability of maid service um, or what was um, offered through the maid service. Um, we know here in Colorado of a few different centralized maid services and they're set up in different ways. They provide different levels of assistance, different um, ways of coordinating and assisting uh, the physician who's involved in attending or consulting. We did, I think, find this uh, promising exploratory finding of use of a maid service being associated with maid involvement being more emotionally fulfilling and less professionally risky. So I'm wrapping up and I hope that you are thinking about your questions that you want to put into the Q&A. Um, our surveyed Colorado physicians are willing, prepared, and actually participating in different MAID activities to different degrees. We can't know the exact distribution of MAID physicians um, across the state, and to, we can't say if it's sufficient to meet regional demand for MAID services. Physicians serving as MAID consultants or attendings report positive benefits. There are still multiple barriers to MAID participation um, at the physician level. I think we all also have uh, are aware of and know of other surveys that have looked at barriers at the patient level and also at a health system or a community level. Providing MAID was perceived as ethically challenging and ethics co consults are used infrequently. So um, some of you have an ethics background and uh, we'd be happy to discuss that as well. Our survey has some limitations, so I've certainly alluded to how the results are only generalizable to physicians caring for patients likely to seek MAID services. That really has to do with how in our sampling and our outreach of who we sent the surveys to um, as physicians, they are individuals who are seeing the individuals with the terminal illnesses uh, matching the CDPHE uh, data. Our results do not apply to other states or nat nationally. We are unable to characterize our physician respondents um, in more detail than what we showed. And we didn't survey patients um, or their experiences, which may certainly be different than physicians involved. So here are some next steps, and we'd love to think through additional next steps. Education about MAID we think is a high priority. Thinking about the generalizability um, of these findings um, through a national survey would also be important. There's a need to explore emotional, time, and ethical concerns. And we could also consider the details of access to centralized made services and explore uh, what the actual benefits, which barriers uh, a service is reliably able to help reduce. So with that, comments and discussion are welcome. Um, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Campbell. Uh, thank you, Hillary. If, if you could unshare your screen, Hillary, uh, thank you very much. So <clears throat> that was a terrific talk. Thank you very much. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of questions here and a lot of really interesting questions. So we'll start with the first question uh, from Corey Carroll. Can you tell us, Dr. Lum, what you know about the extent to which similar studies like this one have been done in other states around the US? Um, thank you for that question. I think that this is the first that has sought to sample across a full state. Um, many of the studies that we identified were um, specialty specific. Um, 
look, asking about oncologist practice or family medicine practice. So I think that there's some uh, true um, additions to the literature because we started from the Colorado All Payers Claims Database and then linked to the NPI. Eric, what would you add? Yeah, and, and the novelty here is in the idea that rather than select a huge sample and screen down to a small number of doctors that participated, we started from the other side, which is we attempted to target this so that we were able to conduct this study on a very lean budget. Rather than spending a couple million dollars to do this study, we were able to do the whole study for about $275,000. And we did that so that we could increase the likelihood that other people would be able to access funding from places like the Greenwall Foundation, who typically don't provide huge grants to do this. So our goal was really to develop something that we can use and other people can use in other states with a, a limited amount of funding uh, to support novel research in this area. Um, <clears throat> Hillary, could you, uh, Dr. Lum, could you talk just a little bit? A question from Rebecca. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, Tholman asks, uh, do you recommend that the medical community adopt a consistent terminology when referring to medical aid and dying? And if so, how would that be helpful to researchers? A great question. So I think that um, it it would be helpful to adopt common language. And I, as a primary care physician, often think about where might my, my patients or their families be interested in, act, in a discussion or information broadly speaking. And if we don't have a common language between patients and um, clinicians, that also is another barrier. So I agree with the challenges in our medical literature uh, and how that impacts our ability to do research, uh, including searching the literature without having common te te um, terminology. But then also if the terminology is somewhat stigmatized, and especially if we um, end up having trouble getting into the conversation because we don't have a shared sort of authentic and trusted space to enter in, that's also a challenge. And I am not aware of, though they probably have been done, uh, asking a patient and family members what their preferred language would be and what type of knowledge and education they would want you know, and specifically to discuss in the context of a clinic visit compared to also the information that's available on the internet or through other organizations. So I think that there are challenges to how we can um, address knowledge is issues and it, certainly language is part of it to know that we're talking about the same thing. And, and just to put a finer point on that, from a policy perspective, those that think about policy know that defining the language is the first kind of battle in winning the policy debate and, and moving policy towards one's position. And so it's essential, we believe, that the terminology is not controlled by the advocacy groups on both sides of this debate, that the terminology needs to be set by individuals who are neutral and, not, and don't hold deeply entrenched positions from which they cannot be moved. And so for that reason, I think we see this persistence of a lack of a common lexicon regarding this because it reflects the advocacy positions of both sides of the debate who feel very deeply about controlling the language in order to control the narrative. But with that said, we, that's why we take our terms from the law and how it is legally stated rather than doing that. And this is a debate among ethicists and will continue to be a debate on among ethicists for a very long time because ethicists love to debate terms. Um, a second question here from an anonymous attendee is says, 
how can we prevent physicians from imposing their own religious beliefs, biases regarding MAID on patients who do not share those beliefs? For example, some religious physicians may not even talk about uh, MAID to patients because of their religious beliefs. I, I think our data shed some light on that. So Dr. Lum. I think that by asking about this barrier, we had maybe an opportunity of asking someone to think if they have an implicit bias that can become explicit. So that's perhaps one step toward then um, creating the space for conversations to happen or for participation in whatever level to happen. Um, I think that I'm not an expert in this, and it, it, it's a, it, I appreciate the question. Um, so I might jump in here and, and then it might stimulate a response, uh, a, mo a more a th a thought, uh, a response from you, Hillary, is um, there's debate in the bioethics community about if and to what extent physicians should disclose their personal views about medical aid and dying, not only from a religious perspective, but from a professional perspective to patients. Um, leading ethicists um, such as Dr. Bernie Lowe have suggested that in fact, it is a moral duty of physicians to tell patients their views. Others have argued that the very telling of those views may in fact bias patients either towards or against. Um, and so this is a really important debate that has not been settled. And we don't know the extent to which physicians do or do not disclose their views. And clearly this is not unique to medical aid and dying. There's many other types of medical procedures for which physicians uh, can hold uh, exemptions or, uh, or, you know, not favor. And so um, I think at this point, this debate has not been solved, but, but the, the questioner put a very fine point on one of the key things to understand in the future is, do doctors do this and what effect it has? But in the end, that's a question that we need to ask patients right? And we need to ask them, did your doctor talk about it? Do you feel like your doctor supported this or not? Um, and so we'll have to do, we take great comfort in the fact that 85% of physicians say they're willing to discuss this. Now, we didn't ask whether they're willing to discuss their personal or professional or religious beliefs, um, but at least the discussion and willingness to discuss is a uh, almost universal factor among physicians in Colorado. Any other additional responses, Hillary? Yeah, thanks for um, describing sort of the different ways that we can think through this. Great. Um, Patty Meyer asked a great question, which said, ethics concerns is a very broad term. Any ideas exactly what the ethics concerns are? Uh, we would love to explore that more. Um, as a team, we have um, some, some, some thoughts about it. Uh, and yet we didn't really get a chance to match this with a qualitative interview to explore for individuals who did felt that this, you know, find that this was um, ethically challenging to explore in what way. Right. And, and traditionally, ethicists have thought about these ethical terms in terms of like key principles about things like patient, uh, about harm, right? About benefit to patients, about patient autonomy, about things like justice and access. And, and in our mind, those are the things that, that kind of comp, comp, comprise this ethical concern. But for me, as I think about it, um, it also is has something to do with issues of professionalism in medicine means and how participation in aid can be part of that or could be kind of 
against that. And so for me, it's the traditional ethics concerns coupled with a kind of professional dissonance among some physicians about how this practice may in fact conflict with their view of what it means to act professionally within the context of medical practice. Dr. Lum, any uh, other thoughts on that? Um, I'm happy to pick up also Patty's question. So ethically challenging and yet ethics consults not used comments on that. And I think that this was actually very um, contextual, it tells us a lot about perhaps access to ethics consults as much as anything else. So uh, that's one hypothesis. Ethics consults may not be readily available um, to the physicians who were uh, participating in the MAID activities. I think then a second um, potential reason could be um, that thought that, well, maybe it increases barriers or, you know, and we have to balance the challenge of barriers and uh, benefit. For instance, for me to be able to coordinate a uh, ethics consult outpatient would certainly add to the time um, aspects of this. However, we could imagine that if we're able to work as a team in including or involving multiple services, including social work, hospice, ethics, that then there could be coordinated approaches really to, to understand what's challenging for the patient and their family uh, so that we can uh, move forward and pursue, you know, next steps that are right for what the patient wants. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, one, one, one person asked if, if we personally know any physicians who have provided MAID, um, and uh, I think the answer to that is a resounding yes, that we know and have discussed this with multiple providers. That was part of our structure for developing the survey. Um, so we uh, have done it. However, we will never, nor will any member of our team ever disclose who those physicians are simply because it would break the kind of promise of anonymity which we provided to the people who participated in this research. Um, I guess the other way of asking that is, do we know if any physicians have personally requested MAID um, related to their own terminal illness? And I, anecdotally, I don't think I could find it, but anecdotally, I know of individuals in California, like friends of friends. Right. Uh, interesting question by Bonnie is she was told by a hospice that their physicians could not legally participate in MAID because their services are paid for by hospice and thus Medicare and no federal funds can be paid for that services. Hillary, do you have any insight into that? I know you're not an attorney, but uh, you provide care in that in those settings, so. I think that um, more, uh, so yes, I, I have heard that this, this to be true. And I think that that, um, is again where it can be helpful to think through, is it all of the activities of medical aid in dying or is it potentially the some of the groupings that we tried to define and then ask about from discussing, referring, serving as consulting, serving as attending. So yes, to, Bonnie, to your question, um, I am aware that there are some hospices that have chosen that their physicians related to their agency could not participate. Um, I actually don't know the impetus or rationale for that. Um, and I th I've certainly heard the concern that Medicare would not pay. Um, and so I apologize that I can't provide a more specific answer. Uh, Dr. Lum, there's a number of questions in here asking for clarification on kind of a maid service and what that would look like. Maybe you could just discuss briefly, for example, what uh, the what, what a maid service might look like, uh, either at you know UC Health or Denver Health or one of those organizations you're familiar with. Yeah, I find that a maid service could be a, a physician facing resource that exists so that if I as an individual have an individual have a patient who's interested in the process for medical aid in dying, there are a number of um, 
processes, including specific documentation, needing to understand which pharmacies are providing, thinking through what are the different medication options, understanding CDPHE reporting. So thinking about the need, number of things that need to be done and that I may have gaps in my knowledge to do, I could then reach out to um, a navigator who's knowledgeable in the different aspects of both the Colorado statute, but then how that could be accessible within the context of um, my local patient care environment. Um, so I think it, we, we hypothesize that made services are most likely situated within health systems um, where a shared resource can be made available. Um, and that also has the benefit of, you know, the shared EHR and potentially other shared connected services, social work, palliative care, ethics, pharmacy, et cetera. Um, so that's one example. Um, Eric, what would you add? Uh, no, no, I, th I think that's exactly right. And, and the issue is the fact that um, made services tend to be associated with large health systems, right? And so patients who come to large health systems uh, or cared for them may have more, and physicians may have more access to this. The issue is that these generally don't exist or may not, physicians practicing outside of these large health systems may not be aware of them and may not be aware that their, their patients can essentially um, be referred if they follow some rules to, to receive those services. Um, I, I was looking here, uh, there, was, there was an interesting question that I, I actually had not thought of. Um, and someone asked, does uh, MAID cancel a patient's life insurance? Um, I don't know the answer to that. Dr. Lum, do you, do you know the answer to that? Uh, I don't know the answer to that specifically either. That that is a terrific question, um, and uh, gosh, I am going to go. And, find and I out. have yes, and I have to admit that as I, I as a physician, um, even if I did know the answer to that, I don't know that I would feel confident in counseling related to that. I would feel that that is out of my scope. Right. Right. Um, and then uh, one, uh, we have time for one last question, Hillary. Do you see something in the Q and A that you particularly would like to address? Thank you, Rebecca, uh, for typing in. Um, it does not cancel insurance because it is defined as not suicide by statute. Appreciate that. Perfect. Perfect. Well, um, we are rapidly approaching the top of the hour, um, Dr. Lum. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this. We greatly appreciate it as a member of our research team. And, and thank you to the participants. We understand very much how busy your lives are. And, and we understand very much that taking an hour of your time is a major uh, gift to us to see what we've done. And we hope that the information we've provided has been important for you and can help uh, you as you think about medical aid and dying. Um, we, along with our funders, are very interested and motivated to ensure that the results of our research are used to inform the practice of medical aid and dying. And so, you know, this is part of our dissemination efforts is uh, part of what we do to ensure that we don't do research that just gets published in papers, but that we take our research out to the community. Um, and uh, everyone should note that this study was a very first study that has ever been done. It is not the definitive answer. It will never be the definitive answer and it's not intended to be. It's intended to stimulate further research and intended to begin to address issues to improve access to MAID uh, for those patients and also kind of the, pay, the providers who do it. So with that, I wanna thank everyone in attendance today. I, I, I uh, again, appreciate your time commitment with us, with us today and thank you very much.